Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fun show for you this evening. Matt Yunkin is here, as you can see, and uh, I'll do a brief introduction. Usually do this uh, separately, but we're just trying to catch up on uh, time and uh, have a, a really great evening set for you this evening. First, a couple quick notes. Anyone going to Oshkosh, please come and find us there. We're running our snag some swag promotion. You hunt down uh, one of us here from Social Flight and we've got some very cool things to give away if you catch us when, we're, when we still have some stuff on us. And so with that, I would like to introduce Matt Yunkin. Um, Matt Yunkin is one of my favorite performers. His Beach 18 performance is likely the most unusual act on the air show circuit, basically because the Beach 18 was never designed for aerobatic flight, but that doesn't make it incapable of doing it or any less beautiful. He's a third generation pilot, the son of legendary air show pilot Bobby Yunkin, and grandson of Jim Yunkin, who's well known for designing the Century and True Track autopilots. Most recently, Matt's been dedicating his time to preserving the stories of what some may call the ge greatest general aviation uh, group of civil aviators, uh, very affectionately known as Freight Dogs. And we're going to talk about it all tonight. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Matt Yunkin. How are you doing, Matt? I'm great. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. Like I said, it's an honor to be a part of this. I really do appreciate it. So um, I want to start with the beginning. You, you, when we talk about your background, your family tree just, just goes in one line of famous people in general aviation. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that and what it was like to grow up in that world. Well, I, it was... It was definitely a different way to grow up. I mean, I had a very wonderful childhood, and uh, I've uh, been privileged to uh, spend a lot of time with some really neat people uh, as it pertains to all of the different facets of aviation. Uh, you know, my, both of my grandpa's brothers were naval aviators during World War II, and so they had uh, um, that tie and the, that legacy that I was uh, fortunate enough to get to hear about growing up. My, my great uncle Bob actually was an uh, instructor in the Navy in Beach 18s. He taught multi-engine transition training for the Department of the Navy uh, in their SMBs and JRBs, which is basically the airplane I'm doing an air show in today. So that ties all the way back there. Uh, my grandpa uh, was just a little bit late or a little, a little young to join up in time to be a part of World War II. So he ended up uh, uh, joining the Army and using the GI Bill to put himself through college, where he'd earned a degree in electrical engineering. And he developed several different uh, notable uh, aviation instruments. Uh, the, the one he's most famous for is the Century Series Autopilots. And so he did that. He uh, retired from autopilots and built a couple of fantastic air racing replicas and restored a whole bunch of antique airplanes. And then he got bored with that and got back in the autopilot industry and developed the first digital autopilot for experimental aviation. So he yeah, had three very successful careers doing different things. And, uh, and of course, my dad was a on-demand charter pilot. You know, he started out as an airmail pilot in Beach 18s and then eventually became an on-demand freight operator and uh, did air shows as a sideline. And, you know, here I am today as a result of all of that background. That's a Fascinating. I didn't even realize that, you know, I said that the lineage was just one straight line. I didn't realize it was your great uncle that probably was the first in the Beach 18 pilot line. It was. That's actually uh, how come we ended up with a C model twin beach that, that my dad put into the air show arena in 1988. Uh, uncle Bob actually took the, so during World War II, basically all of the twin beaches out there, whether they were bombardier trainers, navigators like the one I fly, or multi-engine transition trainers, um, gunnery trainers, all, all of those airplanes were basically equipped the same way as it pertained to the airframe. And after the war, the ones that were still in service with uh, the Navy and the Army Air Corps went back to Wichita and were remanufactured into D-model Beach 18s, which is all, all the low cabin twin beaches you'll see on an air show ramp or D-models. 
So they were either built in 1946 or later, or they were remanufactured in 1946. They put a, a heavier spar in them, lengthened the nacelles, they put a different landing gear under them, they changed the incidence of the tail so they'd haul more weight in the back and go a little faster. And my Uncle Bob actually took the Navy's first airplane, uh, popped it off, and went back six weeks later and picked it up. And as he flew it back to the Navy base, he said they ruined it. Said it never flew right again. So years later, my dad fell in love with uh, Twin Beaches as a kid. I guess so one of them came into the service center uh, uh, at Mitchell Industries where my grandpa was building autopilots to have an autopilot installed. And that's when dad thought that was the neatest airplane he'd ever seen. And he ended up, like I said, flying mail and freight in the later model airplanes with a high cabin and all that. And dad said the one crazy idea that he couldn't sleep off after being up on, you know, for three or four days at a time, uh, making all this money hauling freight was doing air, an aerobatic demonstration in a twin beach. And my grandpa and, and his brother Bob had bought just the right airplane because they wanted to see model twin beach just to play with, you know, as a couple of aviation collectors. And that airplane was sitting outside, uh, on the ramp in Springdale after dad brought it home from, uh, from where it came from, he said it was lighter and faster than any beach he'd ever flown. And one thing led to another. He did his first show in that in 1988. So, and here, here we are in 2022 and I'm still doing air shows in a C model twin beach and I'm doing night shows with it. And you know, it's so this, this story started, back in the early 1940s for my family that put me here today doing air shows in the Twin Beach. That is so amazing. I didn't even realize that that the vast majority of the Beach 18s that are out there were all remanufactured ones. Then and and it's also fascinating that they went to do that and yet of course you were saying that they flew better before that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, my uh, my show beach will fly comfortably 20 miles an hour slower than my freight beach stalls. So it, it's, it's just a totally different, uh, it handles totally different. It's still a twin beach, you know, the, the print, it does some neat things, but the, uh, the principles of flying it, you know, doing single engine operations and the way you load it and CG and all that stuff, they're, they're very similar in that regard. You know, uh, we didn't, you know, we weren't able to untrain all of the important, safety aspects of, you know, uh, flying a beach 18 when we, you know, put smoke on the other one and started doing silly stuff with it. <laughs> so were they basically just trying through the D model to, to make it a more utilitarian kind of tame down some of that and increase the load ability and the safety factors? That's correct. You know, the airplane, uh, the D model is more, it, it will carry more and it goes, it's supposed to go a little bit faster, but it flies more like a King Air. You know, the D model and then the E model that, you know, we have that's the freighter that I'm hoping we'll talk about here in a little bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, those, those are very stable instrument platforms that with very long range and, uh, you know, they fly more like a corporate, you know, a heavy twin that, you know, they still use for corporate work today. And the show beach flies more like a big cub. So. Wow. That's amazing. And, and it's it's so wild to think. I mean, let's show a couple quick pictures here. I want to show some people. Uh, about the aircraft that we're talking about. And of course, you've got this, I want to talk about this in a bit, your iconic night show, which I absolutely love. Uh, absolutely love seeing Thank this. You. And um, it, there's something about those two radials going uh, for a night show that you just can't beat. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a wonderful flying airplane. It's very honest. It's a good platform. And as you can see, it's got a lot of room and a lot of interesting places to hang lights on it. Yeah, <laughs> that's for yeah. sure. It, it, and uh, let's find a, a daytime picture of that to show everybody here because it's, uh, it, it it's a beautiful aircraft. Um, that's, that is for sure. Have you flown others that are in to the, to the, I guess I'll call it the the un, uninformed that are kind of in the similar look and feel and world of that, like the Lockheeds and things like that. Have you ever tried any of those? Uh, I've never flown a Lockheed. I'd like to. Um, you know, there's everybody has a different opinion. My dad always said that a Beach 18 was just a Lockheed they took all the ugly out of. But, uh, <laughs> 
But if you put a if you put a Lockheed and a Twin Beach on the ramp side beside, the Lockheed looks like it was handcrafted by an artist, and the beach looks like it was stamped out of uh, you know very rudimentary parts. So they're uh, they're they're very similar looking, but they're also very different. And I, I would assume they probably fly quite a bit different as well. Wow. So the BJ teams, where that's what you grew up around, and and tell me a little bit about what it takes to transition an aircraft like that into uh, using it in an aerobatic environment? Because obviously the most famous person to ever do that uh, so far is, is Bob Hoover. And yet when I think of who's number two, it's you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I can't take credit for it. So like I said, my dad pioneered the concept and he did it for 15 years before he passed away. So I just kind of picked up the family business and kept it going um, after um, he was no longer with us. You know, and then, and then I ended up doing the light show on my own, you know, a couple of years later. But uh, as far as uh, equipping the airplane and getting the FA's blessing to do that, uh, the airplane had to be put in experimental uh, exhibition category. You know, and the only modifications to the airframe are the addition of a smoke system and a G-meter. Hmm. So the G-meter and the panel to, you know, make sure I'm not pulling too hard on it. And uh, we we carry a you know, a bunch of smoke oil, as you can see in the in the pictures. So uh, my dad was able to uh, gain that approval from the Little Rock FISDO uh, based on a relationship he had with him. He was going down there taking a 135 check ride from him every six months in his freight beach. And he became such good friends with some of the uh, uh, examiners down there. I mean, I remember one guy that uh, – uh, that ended up giving me my multi-engine rating when I was 17. Uh, he was his name was Rick D'Angelo, and he and Dad rode motorcycles together. They became such good friends. But anyway, uh, with Dad's uh, credibility that he gained in the freight market and uh, uh, Grandpa's creativity that he had gained through all of his uh, uh, restoration work, uh, Dad found just the right guys to. Uh, you know, print a set of operating limitations for just this one airplane. But they still, they knew if there, if anybody could do this, it'd be Bobby Youngkin, because he was already, a, yeah, he was a very gifted aviator and already a, a very uh, a notable airshow performer, you know, for the work he'd done in the T-6 and some other stuff he'd flown. And, but they were still skeptical. So when they uh, um, showed up, I believe it was at Huntsville, Arkansas, they uh, created a, wavered airspace and dad went out and was going to demonstrate for the FAA, you know, what he was going to do with this airplane. And the deal was, you know, you, you go out and you do your maneuvers, you land. And when you get done, uh, don't touch the G meter. We want to crawl up in there and see just how hard you're pulling on the airplane. So anyway, the FAA watched the whole show and dad had a, you know, a habit of carrying a glass of ice water with him when he would get in the twin beach to go do anything. And what he ended up doing is he'd drink the water, he'd throw the ice out the window and throw the cup in the back. And then when he got to wherever he was going, he'd clean the trash out and move on. Anyway, he set this cup of ice water that he wasn't done with down between the seats on the floor uh, just ahead of the spar cap. And when the FAA crawled up in the airplane after the demonstration to look at the G meter, they he kind of stumbled and tripped and looked down and saw that glass of ice water sitting there on the floor without a drop spilled out of it. <laughs> he just looked at my dad and shook his head and left. He didn't, he didn't check anything else. He signed off the paperwork and the rest is history. <laughs> That's amazing. Perfect, perfect 1G maneuvers. T tell, exactly. me what, tell me what the, what the routine entails. Like what, what are the types of things that you're actually doing that we're going to see in next week uh, in your routine? Well, uh, the airplane uh, will do rolls, point rolls, um, uh, loop, Cuban 8, turnarounds, uh, and then I'll uh, uh, dirty the airplane up, put the gear and the flaps out, and do what we affectionately refer to as the elephant walls. And so, uh, you know, the, the show starts and ends to that corny pink elephants on parade music, and, uh, you know, which kind of capitalizes on an obese airplane trying to work up the energy to roll over and do aerobatics. <laughs> so uh, it works out great. But the, the, the middle of the, the show is done to a more graceful soundtrack that that really complements the, the beauty and grace that, you know, that the airplane has. I mean, there's you, you can't really 
you, you don't tell the airplane what to do. You ask it politely and wait on it to get it done. <laughs> And uh, so it, the uh, the appearance from the outside is that the aerobatics are very smooth and graceful because that's really the only way you can do them in a beach shape team. But it works that, great. That's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, and that, thinking back on what you just told me about the story of uh, of how working with the FAA and doing that demonstration, that does beg the question. You know, what's the what's the internal family lore of the first time? that he actually did the aerobatics in the plane. Because obviously, he, he, it's not like he went out there for the FAA and said, okay, so I'm going to try this for the first time in front of you. Well, the uh, I, I will not use names because the statute of limitations may or may not have run out on this story. But uh, <laughs> shortly, after my, shortly after my dad married my mother, uh, they moved up to Rapid City, South Dakota, where he took on a job flying night airmail in Beach 18s. And he ended up uh, on his first stop uh, on the mail run, he ended up meeting another fella uh, that was a comp working for a competitor. And they actually became very good friends. So the, the story goes that my dad would hurry up and load his freight as fast or load his mail as fast as he could, and the other guy would take his sweet time loading his up so that they could end up meeting in the air someplace between the destination and doing formation stuff and messing around. And anyway, uh, apparently one night uh, the other fellow was uh, uh, was out minding his own business, and Dad called him on the radio, "Hey, where are you at?" You know, and he gave him a position report. And then there was some banter back and forth, followed by tally ho, don't move. And so this poor fellow's looking around, you know, he's got his hands glued to the yoke, and he's looking around, and he looks back through the windows, the passenger windows in the in the cabin area over the sacks of mail, and sees this white flash go by. And so he looks out, out the side window, and there is the plan form of a, a fully loaded twin beach. You know, it's probably got 1,500 pounds of mail in it, barrel rolling around the one that this poor fellow was flying. <laughs> so anyway, apparently some obscenities were said, and Dad's response to all of that was he parked his airplane out in front and says, all right, it's your turn. <laughs> And uh, I have not heard how the story ended. Apparently that part, uh, that's, that's all he's willing to talk about. But so anyway, <laughs> that this dates back to the mid 1970s. And, and I can assure you that there's not a twin beach on earth that somebody hadn't rolled in the middle of the night. I mean, <laughs> get bored going straight level. And I'm sure, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the urge to just do something to stay awake takes over. So, and they, they do roll really nice. So, that's anyway. what I was going to ask is what is how, how do they roll? <laughs> they they roll very nice. At least at least the red and black one does. <laughs> so um now the obviously that you're you went through a restoration recently of an aircraft that is near and dear to your family. Tell me the story about how uh this plane which I'm going to show here which was in your family found its way home. So, that I'm very sentimental about that airplane. Um, I, uh, yeah, I grew up in an aviation family, and I can say with certainty that about 85% of the memories I have uh, growing up uh, that have an airplane in them somewhere have that airplane in them. You know, it was either the centerpiece of the story, or it was in the background while something else was going on. But that airplane was always, always around. And uh, so my the way it worked, I told you, they flew. Dad flew night air mail. Uh, then he moved to Malden, Missouri after that and flew some more night air mail. And then when he moved back to Arkansas, where uh, my parents were originally from, uh, he bought a Beach 18 of his own and modified it for cargo and started hauling freight in it. And I don't know why um, around the time I was born, Dad sold that original Twin Beach and bought the one that you see in the pictures. So shortly after I was born, he acquired this airplane, and he hauled freight in that airplane until I graduated high school. So he personally put 8,000 hours on that airframe all by himself. Wow. And anyway, I grew up, you know, oiling and fueling and washing that airplane. And, and during the Christmas rush, when I was out of school, I got to go on some of the freight runs. 
and it was just magical. I mean, there it was one of uh, three airplane, three twin beaches that would take off from Springdale, Arkansas, about the same time, and then another one left Fort Smith, and another one left Texarkana. And then there was, I think, a, another one that may have come from Little Rock or Oak City. And all of these airplanes would descend on Dallas-Fort Worth uh, with their UPS cargo to offload and be reloaded and sent back out in the night to the, you know, do their deliveries. And you can imagine the commentary on the air-to-air -air frequency. I mean, it's better than any, you know, any stand-up comedy show you could ever imagine. I'm sure there were ham radio operators and people with scanners at home that would tune into the the freight dog show as it passed over their house at a certain time every night. And so it was just, it was just incredible to get to witness that as a kid. But, you know, the airplane, um, like I said, he sold it when I graduated high school and uh, it went to um, a couple different fellows and a friend of mine ended up with it and he uh, had it out in, in Western Kansas. And he, he uh, flew it for a little bit and then partially disassembled it because he was going to restore it and make it absolutely perfect. Well, you know, life gets in the way. And 18 years later, after it had been sitting, you know, not moving for 18 years, basically, um, he called me up and said, hey, you need to come get this thing or I'm going to put it in trade play. So we made a deal that I couldn't refuse on it. And uh, uh, my mechanics, Jeff Gibbs and Tyler Hankel and I spent the better part of a month over four different trips working on this airplane, you know, 12 hour days, uh, just as long as I could keep those guys out there before they needed to get back for other obligations. Uh, and we ended up flying at home. So. Wow. So there's a picture of you guys working on it, uh, uh, right there. And, uh, can't, can't quite tell if that's you on one on one part of the engine. <laughs> now those are that's Jeff and Tyler. Jeff is uh, my crew chief. He's been working on uh, the the uh, show beach for the last sixteen years, and that's him on the floor in the blue shirt. And Tyler's up there on the ladder hiding behind that cylinder. But the guys were they're actually at the airport as we speak, getting that airplane ready for Oshkosh. Uh, wow. We. We have a pair of fresh overhauled engines uh, just hung on it and some brand new propellers from Hartzell Aviation. And uh, I was at the airport running the airplane before I rushed home to be on your program tonight. And when we're done here, I'm probably going to go do a taxi test. So we're, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're burning the midnight oil trying to get her ready to go so we can uh, get back up there and try to collect some more of those freight stories that we, uh, that we were so excited to get last year. Are you uh, you excited to put that uh, that Hartzell prop on? I know we we're, we're partners with Hartzell as well. We just put a, a Hartzell navigator on our uh, Bonanza thing thing climbs like it doesn't like to be on the ground anymore. Um, oh, uh, you, you looking forward to having that on there? Yes, sir. Yeah, that they, we they're hung on there, and they it, the engines made noise yesterday, and the props are just as smooth as silk. I isn't mean, that, isn't that something? You know, my my. My show beach has the ham standards on it. You know, they're two bladed props and they're noisy and they, they're, excuse me, they're perfect for the air show work, but the hard soles are just so quiet and smooth. I mean, it's like sitting between a pair of turbines. It really, really is. And, uh, you know, it's funny that th this airplane, you know, it flew home with the hard soles uh, that were on it when I reacquired it. And like I said, it had sat for 18 years, did the test flight with it. Well, all right, let me back up real quick. So we had driven out a couple of times to work on the airplane and driven home. Well, the last time we went out there, we were getting close. And to save time, I loaded my mechanics up in the show beach. and We flew out to western Kansas and parked the beach. And before we got out, I said, all right, fellas, Friday afternoon, we're, we are going back to Arkansas on a twin beach. I hope it's the one that's in the hangar. But just in case it's not, we've got one here. So either way, we're good to go. Well, anyway, long story short, we did the test flight. Uh, everything worked flawlessly. And uh, then we uh, loaded up and came back home. So uh, one, of my, one of the guys had to get home early. Tyler had to get home early. So he borrowed a truck uh, and drove back to Arkansas on Friday. Well, Sunday, Jeff and I flew the freight beach home. And then Monday, I got in the truck and flew or drove it back out and jumped to the show beach and brought it home. 
And that was the noisiest, shakiest ride I've ever had in an airplane was getting back in that show beach and coming back to Arkansas. <laughs> that after flying the freighter with the, the, the quiet Hartzell propellers on it, you know, I, it, it's just, the, the airplanes are so totally different. It's like getting out of a Cadillac and jumping on a Harley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of took the fun out of it there for a while. Just just briefly until you realize that you're going to be going upside down and all the other stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I had to get used to it again. <laughs> so the white airplane will, with those hearts will propellers will definitely spoil a person. It really oh, does. man, I can, I can only imagine. Um, tell me about what's involved in maintenance on one of those planes, because uh, you're certainly, uh, you've got two guys working on it. It certainly sounds like it's a bit of a project. Is Is it all uh, most of that story about restoring that 18 years of inactivity and putting it back together or or is it a maintenance heavy aircraft to begin with well it's it's really the inactivity to be honest Can with I you a soccer? no uh, yeah okay go on I'm, I'm on the phone sorry <laughs> no worries my son uh, knows that when I'm preoccupied and I need to get rid of him he can bring cookies and suckers and whatever <laughs> else and I'm a pretty easy sell so <laughs> Anyway, uh, the inactivity was uh, really it for this airplane. Um, it, it uh, you know, like I said, we, we had the engines gone through. We've got the new propellers for it, courtesy of Hartzell, that we're very grateful for. And uh, the airplane, when I purchased it, it came with all of the spare parts that the previous owner was planning on restoring it with. So we, while we had the engines off, we pulled the gear out from under it and replaced the slide tubes and the chains and the sprockets and the pulleys and, uh, you know, all the bushings and bolts and bearings, everything it takes to make that gear go up and down, we, we put in there brand new. So, yes, it's labor intensive, but we're doing stuff to it now that we should never have to mess with again. Mm. Uh, as so for it's mainly restoration more than maintenance. That's correct. Uh, as for the show beach, you know, it has been a restoration in, process, in progress for many years. And every year it comes out of annual, it's better than it was the year before. But, um, yeah, I'll, we'll go do a show with it, you know, put 10 or 15 hours on it over the course of a weekend. Every Monday morning it comes back and uh, Tyler pulls the uh, cowlings off of it and does a complete firewall forward inspection on it. You know, checking for oil leaks, uh, any any baffles or uh, duct work that's, you know, vibrated loose, any hardware's missing, something that's developed a crack, we've got to fix, just little stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the firewall forward on the airplane, uh, it, it gets a lot of attention every Monday morning, you know, and it's always ready to go by Wednesday so we can leave Thursday to go to the next destination. Uh, as for the airframe itself, it's pretty straightforward, you know, it's a, uh, it's an all-electric airplane. You know, the only hydraulics on the airplane are the brakes. And so, um, you know, pulleys and cables to run the controls. And, uh, you know, it's sheet metal from one end to the other, basically. So it's, uh, you know, it's it, the, the maintenance uh, practices and procedures on that airplane are pretty standard for any other light twin. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, you've got the radials. And that, there, there's... There's certainly something special about uh, one, let alone two of those guys. Well, that's true. Dad always said the only thing that sounds better than a Pratt & Whitney R985 is two of them. And, <laughs> I, and he wasn't kidding. I mean, they, they do make beautiful music together. So, the, and the engines themselves, they're wonderful. They're, they're very reliable. Um, you know, I, I try to take very good care of my engines. You know, we make a lot of noise with them and, you know, I'll run a lot of power during certain maneuvers, but I never over boost them, you know, where we may be turning a little more RPM than the manufacturer says we should, but so does everybody else. But we, you know, never over boost the cylinders and all the power changes are very smooth. So the, uh, the engines are, they've taken really good care of me over the years. And, uh, you know, Tulsa Aircraft Engines has taken very good care of them over the years as well. So very grateful for that support. We couldn't do it without them. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people don't realize that even though these engines themselves haven't been produced in a long time or are, are, are quite old, um, they're very, very well supported. They are. They are. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of surplus parts for them, and there are a lot of parts that are being manufactured brand new for them. So mm -hmm. the engines are becoming more reliable, not less, as time goes by. You know, they have uh, they've developed different procedures for the way that 
for the way they chrome them, the way they bake the blocks uh, for the, you know, the mags that keeps the water out. There's a lot of different things that have been done over the years that, you know, really, really have cut down on the maintenance and uh, operating difficulties that those engines used to have. So mm. anyway, I, yeah. I truly enjoy flying behind them or between them, I should say. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about your project. So um, we, the the and I want to be very respectful when I use the term freight dog because I know that it uh, is one used for those who deserve to use it <laughs> as a term. But this is this is your latest passion, and I I really really identify with it and think it's a wonderful thing. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Well, so freight dog, I would say. I mean, it's not a term that I ever used, but that um, there's a lot of people that refer to, uh, you know, refer to the grungy freight pilots that fly the crappy equipment around as freight dogs. And most of the beach 18s that were crisscrossing the country in the middle of the night back in the day were poorly maintained, poorly equipped and worn out to say the least. And the, uh, the operators were, you know, th there was something special about flying a twin beach around. I heard one of the fellows we interviewed considered it a rite of passage. You know, they say, I think to quote him, he said, uh, you know, 100 hours in a Cessna 310 uh, is less experience than two hours in a Beach 18 because that airplane has so much more that it can teach you. It's, you've got, there's so much more to do to, you know, to, you know, keep it properly cared and cared for and fed. And so anyway, um, you know, the grungy freight pilots that flew these airplanes around, they, they were proud of the fact that they were freight dogs, but to the FBO operators and some of the folks that, you know, the airline pilots and commuter operators that saw them in passing, when they referred to them as freight dogs, they were not paying them a compliment. Mm. So anyway, it's kind of a, um, yeah, like I said, I would consider it a badge of honor that I never was privileged enough to wear. You know, I grew up, uh, my hero was a freight dog. You know, my dad uh, grew up, a big old long nasty beard that probably had squirrels living in it in the winter time and you know always wore you know blue jeans and a button-up shirt you know under his coveralls had a shop towel hanging out of his pocket that was always covered in oil you know and he smelled just like the airplane that he made a living in you know the I mean it the the smell permeated his clothes and the washing machine wasn't good enough to get rid of it so he, he always kind of had that especially during the winter months you know when when the flying got really heavy. But um, anyway, it was it was a really interesting way uh, to make a living. You know, the phone would ring at supper time and, uh, you know, next thing with his food still on the table, he comes back and uh, he's got a bag packed, kisses my mom goodbye. And we may see him the next morning or it may be a week before he gets home. Just We just never knew. So uh, a lot of the uh, freight pilots out there uh, you know, they did on-demand operations like that as well. Others of them had scheduled runs. You know, they worked the backside of the clock uh, several days a week. But the uh, um, the breed is, you know, getting older. They're getting uh, up up in years at this point. Uh, you know, it's a type of aviation that just doesn't exist anymore. This was before the, the Magenta line that uh, all of the kids are following nowadays, and myself included. You know, this was back when, uh, you know, if you had an ADF and a DME in your airplane, you were considered well equipped. So anyway, um, what, what I'm trying to do is collect as many of the stories as I can from that generation of folks, many of which, uh, you know, moved on to very successful airline careers. Uh, some of them uh, quit the job and quit flying altogether after some of the experiences they had in a Twin Beach or other similar airframes in the middle of the night with the thunderstorms and the ice and the snow and the, you know, the, the poor navigation options that they had. So there, there are some really hair raising stories out there uh, that we've heard. And I, it's, we're just, you know, we're just tipping the iceberg at this point. But my goal is to gather as many of these stories as I can and put them in an archive, which we've decided to use a YouTube channel uh, for that purpose. Uh, with the hope that eventually a documentary could be made about uh, about these folks and what they did uh, for a living and about the airplanes that they used, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just a fascinating facet of aviation. And 
Uh, honestly, most of the guys that did it, they don't talk about it. They don't mm-hmm. want to talk about it. it. It was a scary time in their life. You know, they were, you know, uh, very lonely in that airplane after dark all by themselves. You know, probably didn't have much of a home life because they were always on the back side of the clock and gone all the time. And uh, the ones that survived it, many didn't, many, many didn't. But the ones that survived it uh, were made better for it. You know, the experience that they gained having to solve problems and stay ahead of an airplane that was always, you know, trying to give you the finger in one way or the other uh, made them uh, made them much better pilots. And that's that knowledge they've been able to, you know, teach future generations. But the further we are removed from that era, uh, the less of that knowledge base is being passed on, if that makes any sense. So. Uh, another goal for archiving this stuff for me is uh, personally so that the, the kids and the grandkids of these aviators uh, can go someplace and hear these stories. You know, a lot of these stories aren't told around the family dinner table because they're, they're, some of them are frightening. You know, some of them are crude. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of different stories out there. But, uh, you know, I, I wish my son could get on YouTube and listen to his grandfather talk about the experiences he had in the middle of the night in a twin beach. So um, what I'm trying to do is give other kids the ability to hear from, from their relatives, you know, and we're wanting to categorize, you know, um, you know, we're just in the beginning phase of this, but we'd like to be able to tie these to a, a type of an airplane or in number or uh, a type of experience, you know, icing, for example, or engine failure on takeoff, or this or that, where you can get on and you can search any of these criteria fields and up pop, uh, you know, these videos of these uh, gentlemen and some ladies, as a matter of fact, uh, that are telling stories about exactly what it is you're looking for. So the archive is the first goal. And like I said, you know, at some point, if we could, you know, do a documentary or somebody could take this information and run with it, and make a, I think it would be a fantastic movie if this was ever done. I totally agree. I, I mean, it really is amazing. And the stories among that, you know, we've had a lot of wonderful and extraordinarily accomplished pilots and other people in the world on, on our show here. And many of them have a history of getting started and getting their hours flying freight or flying checks and flying things like that around at night. And they talk about having lost friends and, uh, and others and the things that they learned on their path to maybe the, you know, cockpit uh, of, of, a, of a big Airbus or a big Boeing. And it makes you appreciate that amazing experience that some pilots have who hundreds of people are entrusting their lives to. And um, and kind of wonder what what the difference is between that and the next generation of pilots. That's a fact, you know. And it's interesting. There was an article in Sport Aviation that came out in May uh, that featured my airplanes on the cover, and it was all about the freight dog uh, stories that we're trying to collect. And uh, behind the article, they featured three uh, freight pilots, you know, with their uh, grungy attire in front of the Twin Beach. And one of the stories uh, that was, you know, uh, that was in there, uh, 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 Jeff Shetterly, I'm sorry, uh, Greg Shetterly was the one that uh, that was featured in that article. And he talks about uh, some friends of his that were out on a twin beach and they went to sleep on the ILS coming into land their last leg of the night because they'd been up for days and the airplane crashed in Lake Michigan. And separately i'm at an event this weekend doing something else and another friend of mine comes up to me and says i didn't know greg shatterly but i worked for a competitor that was on that airport and i drove by uh that crash and i saw the tail sticking up out of the water it looked like a whale and i ran in the fbo and called the police so your friend greg is telling a story about friends of his that died in that airplane. And while I was driving into work, I saw it and I reported it to the authorities. And I didn't know Greg for 30 years. So that's how tightly connected this community was and how these stories cross tied so many ways. And, you know, for me, um, you know, 
when I started doing aerobatics in the Twin Beach, I had a lot of old timers come up and tell me what they, you know, about the freight that they used to fly. They never dreamed the airplane would do what I'm doing with it and all this and that. And I just would tell them, you know, what you're doing, what you did with your airplane was way more dangerous uh, than what I'm doing with this one. And they'd laugh and they didn't believe me, but I'm, I'm serious. You know, I, I saw it firsthand. And uh, anyway, when I started doing the night show in particular, uh, I would get more and more of these stories and the middle that the, the, the uh, uh, words that are being broadcast over the PA uh, during the break in my night show are uh, basically a dedication of my performance to the active duty uh, military and veterans and all of the salty old freight pilots that cut their teeth on these fantastic airplanes. And since we started reading it that way, we've gotten more and more and more interest. Well, then when the freight beach uh, re-entered my life, I thought, well, shoot, now I've got, I've got the perfect tool and I know just the right people to archive this stuff. Uh, you know, now, now I can actually focus on collecting these stories that these people have been telling me for years anyway. And if we could put them in the archive, that'd be fantastic. So what was fascinating for me was, you know, the airplane reappeared, but while after we made the deal on it, but I hadn't been able to bring it home yet, I started looking around my hangar for some of the stuff I remember from my kid, uh, my childhood. And I found all of the cargo nets. I found the cot that my dad used to sleep on in the back of the airplane. I found the thermoses that he used to leave with hot chocolate in, you know, uh, when he'd leave the house to go on the freight run. Uh, I found his last ever trip sheet, uh, you know, in the, the uh, aluminum uh, clipboard thing that, you know, that had the, the uh, last trip he ever made in that airplane that was a, a revenue run for it. Uh, I found the, the cassette tape case full of Tammy Wanette, Jerry Clower tapes, and the Walkman with the homemade apparatus that would plug it into the headset that he listened to in the middle of the night. And uh, just on and on and on. I found all of these pieces, all of this stuff that used to live in that airplane. You know, uh, that it just stayed with the airplane and um, all of that stuff still existed. So when I brought the airplane home, my wife and I put the cargo liner back in it. It still has the, uh, you know, the wooden floor that was in it when, uh, you know, when he was hauling everything from dolphins to car parts. And, uh, you know, it's it's really is just a time capsule. So. I had the uh, a heat curtain made that was similar to the one that used to be in it where you could zip the cockpit up and hopefully keep what little heat you were able to generate from the janitrol if it was working, you know, in the cockpit instead of having the drafty air coming up over the freight from the tail. And so we put that back in, brought the airplane to Oshkosh, and the interest was just incredible. Um, several people walked by the airplane and just teared up. And they started telling stories to their family members that they'd never told about their time as a freight pilot or as a line guy that was servicing these airplanes in the middle of the night or loading the freight on them. And um, how I knew for sure that I was doing the right thing was we had three or four individuals. Um, well, to describe Oshkosh for your viewers, you just can't. It's aviation mecca. Right. You know, there's a half a million people and 10,000 airplanes that flood that airport over the course of those seven days that, that, that are air venture. And so when you've got all of these airplanes and all of these manufacturers and vendors and workshops and all everything that there is to do that is Oshkosh and three or four guys come do their interviews and then leave and then they come back a couple of days later and want nothing more to do than sit underneath the wing of this wore out freight airplane when there's all this other stuff to do. You know, it just makes you feel like you're doing the right thing. That, that's where these fellows were most comfortable. This is, they could identify more with this airplane than they could any of the other airplanes on the ramp. And it just makes my heart smile to be able to, you know, present that to people you know, and, and get the response in return. It's just great. That is absolutely wonderful. And I love the the kind of commonality and crossover with the fact that you're you're known for that night air show. And that's what so many of those, that's the environment that, that was so dangerous and, and so challenging in so many ways for those freight pilots. That's right. 
you know, the stuff I'm doing is when uh, over an airport in a very controlled environment when the weather is absolutely perfect, the stars and the moon are out, and uh, it's comfortable to it's comfortable weather to be around. These guys, it didn't matter what the weather was doing. You know, they had to go. Uh, mm-hmm. Not going was not an option. You know, you either uh, if you didn't go, um, you know, you were either going to get fired, you know, or they'd find somebody that would take your spot. Right. You know, I had another fella tell me that we didn't do a mag check before we took off because if we had a dead mag, we we're going anyway. So you would do the mag check after you returned to the airport, after you did your run. That way you could tell maintenance about it if you had a problem. And hopefully <laughs> while you were sleeping, uh, the mechanic would fix whatever the problem was because whether they fixed it or not, you were going to get back in that airplane and go back out the next night. Wow. And so... You know, I, I could go on and on and on about the stories and about the culture and the lifestyle. And it was just, it was just different back then. I so. can imagine. Tell me what it's like to do a night air show. What is it? What is that like from, we've seen it from the ground and it, and it seems unbelievable that, that you can do all those maneuvers in the dark, essentially. What's it like from the cockpit? Well, it's it's a lot of fun. It's busy. Uh, it's different than the day show. Uh, my night show is tightly choreographed to a very powerful soundtrack, and I'm actually listening to the music in my headset. And I've got 24 switches and two rotary dials that that I can that are all attached to different lights in the airplane that I can use to change the uh, appearance of the airplane when it comes back for the next maneuver. I can make it appear and disappear and do all kinds of different stuff. So there it's a twin beach cockpit is our, is, is busy and generally busy in the first place. It's even more busy when you're doing aerobatics and when you're doing aerobatics after dark and you're messing with all of these light switches, uh, the workload doubles yet again, but it's fun. It's, it's really, I feel like I really did something when the show starts and stops when the music starts and stops. And I was able to use all the switches and I didn't forget anything. And I got all the maneuvers executed at the right spot. So uh, it's challenging, but the challenge is also what makes it a lot of fun. Uh, As far as doing aerobatics after dark, you know, um, when it's not a beautiful moonlit night, you actually have to build a horizon out of uh, the street lights or the runway lights or, uh, you know, other, you know, buildings or passing cars or whatever that, uh, that you can, put a fix on to reference for the maneuvers. And there are times when I use the instruments at night, you know, I'll check uh, different things more heavily after dark, um, you know, particularly to reset for the next maneuver. So, you know, all the rules are, you know, the rules for aerobatics are the same, but a lot of the variables change and uh, it just, it just adds to the challenge. But at the same time, it's the closest thing. I remember dad telling me, um, He took off out of Decatur, Alabama with a load of uh, car parts heading for Detroit. And he broke out of this uh, low overcast, uh, you know, three or 4,000 feet. And he said the stars were out and the moon was out. And he had Tammy Wynette playing on uh, the ADF. He was listening to WWL out of New Orleans, truck driver station that stays on all night long. And he said, Tammy Wynette was singing till I could make it on my own, which was his favorite song in the whole world. He said it was the most romantic setting he'd ever been in, but he, but he was sad because he didn't have anybody there to share it with. And the, when I, when I do a night show in the twin beach, particularly after it's done and I'm getting cleaned up to land and I pull the props back and I'm just kind of taking it all in the weather is usually so perfect. I, I can say it's one of the most romantic settings I've ever been in. There's just something magical about being in a twin beach after dark. There really is. And it's the closest I've ever been to, you know, um, having that lifestyle myself. So I, I really, really do enjoy it. That's so, so wonderful. Well, Matt, I am so looking forward to seeing you next week at AirVenture, uh, both performing and also uh, just uh, on the ground to say hi. And I'm sure many other people are looking forward to seeing you there as as well. Uh, which days are you performing? So I'm performing Monday and Friday during the day. And then I'm doing both night shows, Wednesday night and Saturday night. 
The freight beach is going to be up there all week as well. We're going to drop jumpers out of it every day, uh, Monday through Saturday for sure. And, uh, and it will be parked behind the Charlie Hillard Operations Building, which is just adjacent to, uh, you know, the, the throat where all of the air show airplanes are parked and uh, real close to Boeing Plaza. So I think if uh, the layout's the same as it was last year, Goodland, or, I'm sorry, Goodyear Aviation will be right across the street from us and uh, one of our sponsors that we, we truly appreciate. But I'll be uh, signing autographs at a lot of the sponsor uh, tents and uh, exhibit hall facilities throughout the week. Look forward to seeing a lot of people there. Um, real quick, uh, for more information about me and what I'm doing with both of these airplanes, my website is yunkinair.com. If you type in yunkinair.com slash 18RY18 Romeo Yankee, um, it pulls up the the story of the freight beach, the mission we're doing, and the link to the YouTube channel that we're starting to build these archives and, and you know put put these archives on. And we encourage uh, anyone that has any kind of a tie to this industry to come visit with us and come look at the airplane, crawl up inside it, you know, take a trip down memory lane with us, and. Uh, get on film and tell us some of your stories. I'm going to have a full-time camera crew there uh, to capture these stories this year. So when the airplane's not dropping jumpers, you know, come by and see it and say hello to us. I'm going to spend as much time there as I can, but uh, when I'm not there, there'll be somebody else there as well. So that's, that's about all I got. Like us on Facebook, Yunkin Air Shows on Facebook. <laughs> absolutely absolutely well thank you so much for coming on social flight live i really do appreciate it matt thank you it's an honor to be here really enjoyed it absolutely have a wonderful night you too and to all of you thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on social flight live we will be off next week because of course we're at air venture again track us down for our snag some swag uh promo that we're running at the show say hi and see if we have something for you and then uh, of course we just released another episode of our no magenta line trip speaking of magenta lines the adventure that we did by just wandering the skies and there is uh, one last installment out there for everyone and we also re uh, released something a great new build stage on this airplane behind me this t-51d mustang from titan aircraft until next time, I would like to thank you all again. We will be back on Tuesday, August 2nd, with uh, all talk about flight helmets and a museum for that by one of the world experts, which is GM Bell of flighthelmet.com. And on the uh, August 9th, we're here with Aaron Fitzgerald doing helicopter aerobatics. And on August 16th, Tuesday, August 16th at 8 p.m., NASA space flight director, pilot, aircraft builder, and writer will be with us, Paul Dye. Until next time, I wish you all blue skies.